Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Ibrahim Aude. Palestine, this stage of the struggle. Much has uh, developed um, in the past uh, two, three months. And so we have uh, Cynthia Franklin, professor of English at UH Manoa, to talk with us uh, about those kinds of development, especially since she has just arrived from Palestine. So thank you, Cindy, for uh, coming over and to share your thoughts and experiences with us. So uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> what is uh, new, I mean, since uh, in the past two, three months, for instance, that has happened in Palestine that um, would allow us to talk more even about what's going on and Israeli practices and Palestinian civil society uh, struggle uh, for uh, uh, independence? Well, what's been going on in some ways is more of the same, and in some ways is an intensification of ongoing forms of violence. I think you know one of the cases that, that I was following very closely that had some kind of uneven resolution was the case of Ahed Tamimi, mm -hmm. um, who uh, is a teenager who was detained and then put on trial for slapping a soldier after the, um, the military invaded her family's home and shot her cousin in the head with a rubber bullet, putting him in critical condition. And um, Israel ate, had, I think, was it 12 charges against her? Mm -hmm. And that was a case that I think the world became very tuned into mm -hmm. in a new kind of way. And um, that case was decided upon, I think, around early April. Mm where she was sentenced to two years, which on the one hand is outrageous because she didn't engage in any actual violence and is a child. Um, and on the other hand, given what people were expecting, did show the, the, the government backing down just the littlest bit mm -hmm. um, in terms of the outcome of that trial. Um, we also have, of course, seen most dramatically the organizing of the Great March of Return um, a six-week um, protest and setting up of camps along the Gaza border um, that began on Land Day, which is a day commemorating the um, expropriation of Palestinian land, and that will culminate on May 15th, which is Nakba Day, or the day that marks um, the um, the expulsion of over 700 Palestinians in 1948. 700,000, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, that's okay, because this is uh, what we call the catastrophe, the Nakba. The Nakba. Which is mm -hmm. the catastrophe, and Israelis talk about it as Israeli Independence Day, mm -hmm. <coughs> by uh, ethnically cleansing the Palestinian mm -hmm. indigenous population. So that is their uh, independence. But uh, it's interesting that Tahd Tamimi's um, case went viral, and it became like, uh, a representation, like a metaphor for the struggle of Palis mm -hmm. uh, Palestinians, especially Palestinian children, mm -hmm. who uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, you know, a lot of Israelis thought like by the third, fourth generation, Palestinians would forget about it and then everything would be hunky dory mm -hmm. and the Israelis would have good relations with the Arabs and uh, they become like the dominant uh, party or the dominant state in the uh, region. But this is not uh, really happening because of the uh, new generation is even more adamant about uh, uh, going for independence. Because if you live under oppression and repression and colonialism, settler colonialism uh, <clears throat> to boot, then uh, you, know, you are subjected to all kinds of uh, these kinds of uh, discrimination and uh, attacks and all of that, uh, and imprisonment and so forth. So could you say something about uh, some of the things that you have encountered while you were in uh, Palestine recently? Sure. Um, I will first say that I went for a two-week teaching residency to Al-Quds University. Al-Quds, the campus I was at, is uh, located in a suburb of occupied East Jerusalem. That is, it's actually only 3.8 kilometers from the old city. Mm -hmm. And so it, it should be an easy walk mm -hmm. to, to that historic site. However, the, the apartheid wall 
uh, divides Abu Dis, the neighborhood of Abu Dis, in which Al Quds University is from the rest of occupied East Jerusalem, which means that at the very bare minimum, it takes about 40 miles, I mean, 40 minutes to get um, into what should just take minutes. Yeah. And so um, Abu Dis is a very, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit desolate <laughs> as mm -hmm. a place, I think, in part because that wall has divided that neighborhood from, you know, it's, it's what was its, what, what was its center. And um, so I was there for a few weeks, and that is a particularly contested neighborhood, perhaps. Uh, it's one Israel has a lot of interest in occupying, and so there are frequent home demolitions there. The army invades it quite regularly to the point that I, I was staying in the campus guest house, which was a kilometer from campus, the main campus, and I was on the eighth floor. And one of the first things that the other residents in that guest house told me was, um, first of all, that it's good to get away during the weekends because almost every Friday night, the Israeli military will tear gas the neighborhood. Uh, they also um, suggested I not dry my clothes on the available clothes lines, wrap yeah. lines outside yeah. because they said yeah. I would um, be likely to find myself itching from the tear gas. Mm. And so that, it, to me, was a kind of sign of how regular the violence is in that, in that area. And in fact, while I was there, the military did, in fact, invade the campus. Um, well, actually, to be technical, they tear gas, they, threw, they lobbed tear gas into the campus, and then they opened with live fire and rubber-coated um, bullets on the students outside the main gate to campus. Uh, 98 students were injured. One student was shot in the head. Another student was shot in the chest. There was a mandatory evacuation from campus by the Red Crescent Society, which is akin to the Red Cross in the U.S. And, you know, one of, for me, the most striking things about what happened was that, uh, first of all, people were very annoyed <laughs> rather than alarmed as this was happening. I had tried to leave campus when the tear gassing began and, and soon after I could hear shots being fired and people said, oh, these are not rubber bullets. This is the sound of live ammunition. So I tried to leave through one of the side gates. I did leave and I was um, following the, the apartheid wall to find my way towards where I needed to go and um, came into um, the, the military shooting into uh, shooting at youth. And so I turned and I, I ran back to the English department. And the thing that was kind of striking is we could hear all this gunfire and our eyes were watery from tear gas, but there were students in that office and they were taking a makeup exam. And they did not want to leave that office, not because of fear of fire or anything, but because they needed to make up that exam and they were intent on making up that exam. And um, it's, it's just, to me, a kind of um, breathtakingly um, brave um, thing to see students that way, but also infuriating that that has to be semi-normal mm, to them. Yeah. Um, I, I went to the grocery store that night, and it was just everything was completely normal. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a wedding that night that I um, heard all these, what I thought were were gunshots and it was fireworks. Mm -hmm. And I realized, uh, or I was told that it was a wedding taking place. And so I was really struck by both the violence every day on that campus and the fact that that life continues on. Um, when I got back, in fact, I have as Facebook friends a number of the students and they were celebrating their graduation. And I saw sandwiched between all these photos of them with their family members and friends that the army had invaded the campus yet again um, and had yet again shot at the students with live fire and with rubber bullets and with tear gas. And um, I remarked on this to one of the students and she said, this is our resistance. Graduating, getting our education, this is our resistance. Yeah. So this becomes uh, the new normal, like, you know, taking an exam under fire, <laughs> which is something uh, amazing, actually. But that's the new normal 
for the Palestinians. But the question, I mean, you mentioned that this has been going on. Uh, of course, it has uh, since um, the occupation of the uh, West Bank and Gaza Strip, among uh, other Arab lands. So now all of Palestine basically is occupied, including, I would say, Gaza, even though there are no uh, Israeli troops in Gaza, but actually, basically, air, s land, sea is controlled by the Israelis. So it's like uh, described as an open prison. You have described it as such. Everyone else has uh, described it uh, as such. But then uh, something happened, and you mentioned Land Day, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which is uh, an interesting one, March 30th, 1976. Mm -hmm. And these are lands that have been confiscated from uh, uh, Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel, not occupied in the West Bank, etc., in the Galilee, you know, mm -hmm. um, the Upper Galilee. I mean, my family is, uh, mm -hmm. is also in the Upper Galilee, my uh, <clears throat> parental side of the family. And some of their lands have been confiscated in 1976 mm -hmm. as well. So <clears throat> now since uh, 1976, uh, March 30th, we Palestinians have commemorated uh, Land Day, you know, and it's, uh, it's a major thing that uh, really um, is now uh, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the object of the struggle for land, uh, you know, and uh, independence and so forth. So um, <clears throat> what, is, what has happened in the past, like, uh, two months or three months uh, that really uh, brought about this... Uh, uh, demonstrations and rallies for return. Uh, so could you say something more about that? Well, I think that the Great March of Return, as it has been called, that, that started on Land Day and started in Gaza, um, involved about, you know, well over 30,000 Palestinians from Gaza approaching the, um, the border, uh, the Gaza border. And that border, it's worth pointing out, is illegal. Um, it, the Israelis are in violation of international law with that border. That border changes, and Palestinians don't know exactly where it is. <laughs> um, and um, there's this uh, amount of space that if you cross, you you know you will be you will be shot. Mm -hmm. um, and the Israeli um, military deployed snipers, a hundred snipers, on that first day to deliberately shoot anyone approach, approaching that border. And the people shot on that day included protesters, nonviolent protesters, who are participating in this great march of return to say that they would reclaim their land, um, that they they want to go home, um, that they have a right to go home. Um, it also included people that were just farming in that area, and journalists uh, were also shot at with with live fire. Israel at the time said that every shot was fired with great deliberation and calculation. There were no mistakes. They've now changed their minds and said, no, no, it was kind of a mistake. Um, but their, their initial response was that they had intended each and every bullet to go where it went. Palestinians have um, continued to, to gather there. And as I said, there were five camps. And there are also, each Friday is a march. And uh, Israel has responded on each Friday with violence. And the situation in Gaza is quite dire from what I read, that um, there, is not, there are not enough medical facilities to handle the thousands of people that have been wounded by um, the Israeli military. And I don't know what that number is. And it keeps changing, but yeah. it's in the thousands. It's about uh, 5,500. 5,500, yeah, around okay. there. And then scores of dead. Uh, and I've run yeah. 40 or more mm -hmm. people who have been shot yeah. dead, yeah. Um, which is, you know, the, and the world is watching this. Yeah. And I think that we are seeing some shift in mainstream, um, you know, uh, views in the U.S. towards this. Natalie Portman is, of course, an index of this. She's a pretty ardent Zionist who refused to accept uh, an award because she she disapproved she didn't actually name Palestinians, but she said that she disapproved of what Netanyahu was mm. doing, and that's a kind of that was a big deal to have mm -hmm. to have mm. um, Natalie Portman refuse that award, um, and I think that the fact that journalists are being shot by snipers also has caught people's attention and children, and um, 
I think that this is, this is outraging. Even liberal Zionist groups and organizations that normally stand in defense of what Israel does. And so I think that this is an important form of mobilization on the part of Palestinian civil society. It's many groups participating mm -hmm. in this. And it is something that is supported throughout Palestine. And that was very obvious to me during the time that I was there. I was in Ramallah, as well as occupied East Jerusalem, as well as Abu Dis. And people were supporting these actions. Um, in There was a general strike the day after um, land day to protest the violence against those participating in the Great March of Return. And um, the in campus invasion that I mentioned that took place the day after that was in response to the Al Quds students having a nonviolent protest, um, a day of a student strike, also to protest what was happening in Gaza. But one of the things that the students there explained to me again and again is that what was happening in Gaza was no different than how they feel living under occupation. They said it's part of this, they, they feel very much part of that same struggle and mm -hmm. set of oppressive circumstances. Um, one student very explicitly connected this to her father's experience of being incarcerated for nine and a half years um, for his political organizing during the first intifada. And, um, and then subsequently being harassed and harassed and harassed for years after that by the military to the point that she said he actually uh, left abruptly for the United States because he could no longer tolerate the constant harassment that he and his family were experiencing yeah. from the military. Yeah, the first uh, Antifada started in 1987, mm -hmm. so uh, December, I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, 1987, and then we had, um, and that it lasted till like 93, you know, mm -hmm. and then uh, we had another intifada, September 20th, 2000, and um, I don't know what uh, you call this one. How do people over there call this uh, these events that are happening now? Is this another intifada, a third one, or is it a different kind of thing? altogether. I did not hear mm. people calling it the third intifada, but I also think that I was there right as this was underway, and I think sometimes things take a while to be yeah. named, yeah. <laughs> and that sometimes happens in yeah. retrospect. But what I did definitely sense was, first of all, a feeling of resolve. And um, I was in the English department with people that are not particularly politically active, and they just kept saying, enough is enough. How much are we supposed to have happen? Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there was also, so a sense of resolve, a sense of determination to change things. And I would say um, a mix of people who felt hopeful about the, the kinds of comings together that were happening mm -hmm. around this great march of return and, and then some hopelessness as well mm -hmm. because um, there was just this sense that you try nonviolently organizing and you're met with violence. Um, violence also is met with, with a, a, an excess of violence, um, that, that everything has been tried. So there, there was a lot of debate, actually, mm -hmm. among the students in particular about, mm -hmm. about hope mm -hmm. and whether hope, you know, how do you have hope? Is hope foolish? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you use your energies? How, how, do, you, how do you survive? Mm -hmm. And that was something that people, you know, think about or thought out loud to me a lot about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I'm thinking like uh, the, one of the uh, strategies of the Israelis is to divide the Palestinians. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> now already um, Palestinians have been divided by like the people who uh, remained in 1948, mm -hmm. right? And there's about a million of them in the state of Israel and Palestine now. Um, <clears throat> and the people outside of uh, 1948. Mm -hmm. Now it's like <clears throat> those uh, Palestinians who are like uh, Israeli citizens, you mm -hmm. know, in 1948. And then you have the West Bank, you have Gaza, and they have deliberately divided uh, Gaza from the West Bank. 
Uh, and also then the people, uh, the Palestinians who are outside of Palestine, geographic Palestine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <clears throat> we are all over the place in Lebanon, mm -hmm. Syria, um, uh, and so forth, you know, in Hawaii, uh, etc. So these are like important things for the Israeli strategy to divide, you know. Uh, and yet um, what I'm hearing you saying that uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza they relate to each other. It's the same, the same struggle, despite the fact that the Israelis have been trying to divide that and create two kinds of entities and so forth, like Palestinian entities. So any, any kind of discussion on this? Uh, I did hear a lot of yeah. discussion on this, yeah. and, and I couldn't um, generalize about it. I yeah. heard many different opinions about mm -hmm. this, ranging from this is one occupation, uh, while acknowledging that the situation in Gaza is, is so much more extreme. Mm -hmm. In fact, the student, uh, one of the students I was talking to who was making this connection was also sort of jokingly referring to Ram, um, Ramallah as the seven star occupation mm -hmm. because there is a kind of material comfort for some people in Ramallah that certainly people in Gaza do not enjoy. Yeah. And so- It's um, like a bubble. This, Ramallah is yeah. a bubble, I mean. Yeah. It's a bubble and mm. yet, you know, people are impacted mm. and live every day under the boot mm. of, of martial law mm. and occupation, even in that most privileged of spaces and even for people who have an economic privilege. Mm. And so I, I heard this idea of one occupation, um, of connection. I've, I heard people commenting on the way that the three different kinds of um, settler colonialism um, are practiced in these spaces, how they, they do serve to divide. You have unequal law, apartheid-like laws inside 48. You have martial law in the West Bank. You have siege and blockade in Gaza. There are different strategies possibly required to resist each of those, not to mention the fact that people in these locations cannot reach one another. Mm -hmm. And and I think that similarly, um, one of the things that's interesting about Al Quds is that there are a fair number of students who live in occupied East Jerusalem. Um, and then there are students who live in, and faculty who live in Abu Dis. Um, those that live in Abu Dis and have West Bank identity cannot go into mm -hmm. East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I for example, um, had two colleagues, one uh, who are family members, one lived just on one side of the wall, one lived just on the other side of the wall. And the, the faculty member who lived inside Abu Dis said with some bitterness, not towards his family member, but towards the fact that unlike his family member, he could not any longer go to the old city. Mm -hmm. He said, I would take you to the old city and show you around, but I can't go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, the, his family member who can go did take me around the old city, but going first to her home for dinner, or for lunch rather, was such a kind of um, taste of the, the daily humiliation and expense and violence that she faces. Um, we had to take a bus to this hideous checkpoint. We then had to go through this checkpoint with lock turnstiles. I had a hand over my passport and have that scrutinized. She had her identity paper scrutinized. We got through the checkpoint and there was a stupid sign that said, have a safe and pleasant stay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we had to take this, this dirt road full of potholes that was next to this completely paved and nice road. Um, we took a cab because she was tired of waiting for buses. We got pulled over while in the cab and um, some military, uh, they were military, although the, the car said police, but they mm. were military. And they searched the car and we sat there for, you know, I don't know, some time while they searched the car and asked the driver some questions. Um, then we continued on to her house. This took close to an hour and it is, it was like two and a half kilometers from campus. Mm. And she does that every day, twice a day. Wow. And, wow. and so she doesn't feel especially privileged, I don't think, <laughs> it, as far as that commute goes, at the same time as she is aware that she can go into the old city, which is beautiful mm. and a place of historic significance for her and her family who can't go there. Mm. And so there is this sense of difference and division, um, and yet 
um, at the same time, people's awareness that, that this brutal occupation impacts everybody to varying degrees. Yeah, it uh, is important uh, to remind our viewers also that, uh, in fact, uh, this entire occupation is illegal under mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. law and under humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, f uh, of this uh, <clears throat> goes by the side, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about occupation and all of that. So I just wanted to remind uh, our viewers that actually these are, uh, uh, you know, practices, Israeli practices, illegal under international law. And uh, to detail a little bit, uh, for instance, one of the things in terms of international law and occupied territory cannot uh, be uh, changed uh, in terms of demographics. You know, the demographics and this cannot be changed, which means like all um, <clears throat> uh, settlements or Israeli colonies uh, are illegal and they are um, confiscating, the Israelis are confiscating Palestinian land and building on it um, colonies, what uh, euphemistically called settlements. So that's one thing, demographic changes occur. Uh, even in Al-Quds, which is uh, called uh, Jerusalem, is Al-Quds in mm -hmm. Arabic. Mm -hmm. And you've been talking about Al-Quds University, mm -hmm. which is Jerusalem University. But, uh, but also, even in uh, the old city of Al-Quds, um, there have been like illegal, uh, under international law, in uh, illegal demographic changes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, could you say something more about Palestinian uh, uh, being evicted and uh, Israeli Jews come over and take over, you know, just like kick them out in a few minutes? I, I believe that the number of illegal settlers is around 600,000, but right. you might know the numbers better no, than around, I. Yeah, around 600, and, and 200,000. And maybe, I do know maybe. that people receive notice for home demolitions. Yeah. Um, which they are supposed to pay for, mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, not that that's the worst outrage, yeah. but it's an added outrage yeah. that you need to pay for the destruction of your own home. Yeah. Um, and I do know that there's a kind of, um, that, that these home demolitions a happen under the least, the most flimsy of pretexts. Uh, you don't have your permit. And they'll mm -hmm. sometimes ask people for permits for, to say that, you know, that they've been there you know, as Israeli homes, but they're pre-1948, so how can they have an Israeli permit? It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Or people will, they'll, they'll kind of um, tear down homes under the pretext of, well, this hasn't, this added room has not been approved. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's concerted attempts to, to grab the land. Um, it happens in different ways. I think Hebron is the most extreme place for this in that, the settlers, instead of building their own on top of a hill settlement or mm -hmm. colony, mm -hmm. as, as you pointed out, is a better name for it, with its own infrastructure, et cetera, in Hebron, they will just go right into people's in the homes of the city, yeah. and, and take them over. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get those settlers out within a matter of a few days, I think, then it becomes virtually impossible to get rid of those settlers mm. who then um, make life a living hell for the people around mm. them. And mm. so, you know, as you said, the settlements are illegal. And, and I would just point out um, that one of the reasons that, that I am active in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, or in my own case, the U.S. campaign for the cult academic and cultural boycott of Israel, is because it's an, a way for people who are um, outside of Palestine to follow a Palestinian call to put pressure on Israel to obey international law. And so the three planks of, of um, BDS are to, you know, to uh, get rid of these settlements, to, to take down the wall, mm -hmm. to get out of, you know, um, this land that is occupied, to return that land to Palestinian and Arab control. The other is um, for yeah. Palestinians mm -hmm. inside of Israel, and they are about 20% of the Israeli population, to have equal laws because there are mm -hmm. 51 laws that on their face discriminate against um, yeah. Palestinians. And the third is to observe the right of return, return. which is, takes us back to the Great March of Return. And one of the, the things about that is to say we have a right to return, right. a UN right to return to our homes. Yeah, in fact, last month we did uh, 
a program on BDS, Boycott, Divestment, mm -hmm. and Sanctions. So uh, it is good, um, mm -hmm. you know, sequel, uh, this in terms of what's happening right now, you mm -hmm. see. Um, well, the, uh, the other thing in terms of illegal under international law <coughs> is uh, the question of uh, here you have like uh, uh, the United States, uh, presumably uh, when uh, things started, um, you know, in 1967 when uh, Israel took over the West Bank and Gaza, um, it was like, uh, okay, um, this occupation and the settlements or colonies are illegal under international law. That was international law and that was the position of the United States. Later on, it started, well, uh, the settlement, I mean, the U.S. position became like a little bit uh, like this. Well, um, these are, uh, the settlements are obstacles to international law. <laughs> they wag their finger and then they fork over their yeah. billions of dollars of aid. <laughs> Please uh, don't do this. Here's then, your money. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then now it's okay. Now we have know? Trump. <laughs> yeah, and now with Trump, I mean, yeah. he is really uh, like violating international law himself. Uh, by doing what he's done. And what he has done is say, we want to move the Israeli, I mean, the American embassy from Tel Aviv, which presumably is the capital of the state of Israel, I mean, before 1967. And um, to say we want to take uh, the, uh, move the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, that means like, I, Donald Trump, uh, say that the United States has agreed that uh, you know, especially in violation of international law, has agreed that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of uh, the state of Israel and Palestine, which is, I mean, you know, total like violation of international law on the side of the state of Israel and Palestine, and of course against uh, Palestinians. Uh, so, could you say something about this, and then what had transpired since? Uh, well, I mean, when you asked me initially what, have, what has transpired in the last few months, I, of course, should have talked about, <laughs> about Trump. I think that I try and block Trump out of my mind yeah. whenever I can. Yeah. But he does pop back up. Yeah. And that, you know, it's, it's like throwing a lit match yeah. into the region. It's a provocation. Yeah. I have no idea if he knows how inflammatory that is um, I, or if he cares if he yeah. knows. I don't know. Yeah. But I think that the, the kind of provocation that that is, the outrage that that is, is has been an added kind of pressure um, that, that we see Palestinians living under. And, and, you know, and just an added kind of out, outrage. Um, the same with these kind of settlers who have been descending on um, Alaska and you know, attacking Palestinians who are attempting to be at prayer. Mm -hmm. So I think that th these there, are, and there also is an escalation yet again in what are called price tag attacks, mm -hmm. which are again attacks on Palestinians who are attempting to go about their day. And this ha these happen frequently inside of the 48 borders mm -hmm. or inside of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so um, Trump's presence, I asked a lot of people, what's it like? <laughs> Has this changed things? And people um, uniformly um, had negative things to say about Trump, unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My favorite was a cab driver who said, we don't like your king. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughed. <laughs> we don't like King Trump. <laughs> and they were pretty sure I didn't like Trump either yeah. since I was in the West Bank yeah. um, <laughs> doing what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and, and there was a more seriously a sense that life has gotten more violent and more unstable since Trump has um, come into power and, you know, kind of made it clear that there is nothing that he will not support on the part of his friend mm -hmm. Netanyahu. Yeah. And so, that it has emboldened yeah. Yeah, the Israelis. Right. And of course, like uh, <clears throat> uh, Trump's brother-in-law, who is an ardent Zionist, actually, mm -hmm. Uh, he's been in a very active uh, in uh, doing all of this, mm -hmm. which is like the moving of the embassy, mm -hmm. you know, that's one. And also talking with uh, Arab states like Saudi Arabia, etc. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, to uh, try and uh, force the Palestinian National Authority mm -hmm. in Ramallah, headquartered mm -hmm. in Ramallah on the West Bank, to uh, agree to Trump's... Uh, 
quote unquote a resolution of the problem of the Palestinian uh, you know Israeli conflict and so forth but in fact even uh, someone like uh, Mahmoud Abbas who is the head of the Palestinian National Authority he couldn't even do that which uh, Trump wanted to do despite all the pressure on uh, Mahmoud Abbas the head of the Palestinian National Authority by Americans, uh, by Europeans, and also by Arabs like Saudi Arabia, especially Mohammed bin Salman, the heir to the throne uh, in Saudi Arabia, etc. Uh, so, did you, while you were there, did you hear anything about like the role of Saudi Arabia or the role of the Palestinian National Authority in all of this, or what is it? That um, I heard plenty heard? about Jared Kushner uh -huh. and about Saudi Arabia uh -huh. <laughs> um, and about the, the Palestinian National Authority. None of it positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I think there was um, a real dismay with mm. the Palestinian Authority, and mm. I mean, who are also just right now withholding salaries from people in right. Gaza and yeah. and pushing things into an even more untenable situation for, yeah. for Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah. Um, and then there was also this sense that Saudi Arabia is, you know, again, uh, um, making a, a terrible situation even worse. Yeah. And so that was consistently the, the kind of sentiment I was hearing from people that, that I was speaking with. Yeah. And it, also just the, the, the ridiculousness of someone like Jared Kushner who has absolutely no expertise whatsoever being assigned this role to to negotiate of course those of us in the u.s are quite used to people with absolutely no Nothing. knowledge <laughs> being put into high yeah. positions yeah. <laughs> um, one of them is trump <laughs> yes yeah. exactly yeah. so yeah and uh, uh, you know his uh, saving grace kushner is that he's an attorney but real estate attorney you know well, uh, one might say, well, that's a real estate attorney. Real estate attorney is kind of too. perfect, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> Land acquisition. So it is just uh, amazing, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, American attempts to try to resolve uh, the problem. But uh, against the, uh, the national uh, interest of the Palestinian people, the indigenous population. So it is rather interesting. The other thing, like in terms of... Uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Israelis have had like an offensive uh, um, the past several years actually, sometimes underground, sometimes like um, um, uh, over the table so to speak, uh, to try and uh, relate uh, better uh, and have good relations with uh, Arab countries like Saudi Arabia, etc. So to the point that um, um, Hamad bin Salman, the heir to the throne of Saudi Arabia, he once, uh, quote-unquote, summoned, uh, 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 what's his name, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian National Authority, and uh, basically asked him, like, you know, you got to go with Trump, uh, you know, on the solution. And he refused to do so because he knew, like, uh, that would be the death knell of the Palestinian National Authority. But then uh, when Mohammed bin Salman came to the United States, and I think it was uh, Time magazine says like, uh, Mohammed bin Salman's charm offensive <laughs> in the United States. Well, charm offensive because they're getting money from him, like four hundred eighty billion dollars. I think, I, I think the thing dollars. I saw was, has he become a Zionist? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is actually a good question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, but the thing is that uh, he mentioned Mohammed bin Salman is uh, the, the Palestinians had better take uh, that offer from uh, you know Trump. Otherwise, shut up. You know, let them shut up. You know. So, <clears throat> and um, this guy has no experience in politics whatever whatever you know how he's like 30 year old guy 31 year old guy and he has blood on his hands in uh, the yemen i mean the even like uh, <clears throat> uh, international human rights organization uh, are accusing him mm -hmm. and then he comes here with a charm offensive presumably because they're getting a lot of money from him the americans like 480 billion dollars and counting so to speak uh, so um that shows how, like, the Americans are also selective in terms of application of uh, international law, human rights, yeah, uh, violations, so. and, and so forth. So did you hear stuff about that uh, while you were in Palestine? Uh, um, 
uh, I mean, along the lines that the hypocrisy of yeah. the United States and of Israel, of course, in right. this regard, um, were daily, were remarked upon in a daily way. But I suspect that's something that you, as you know, given your areas of expertise, can speak too far better and have yeah. just spoken too far better than yeah. I. Yeah, no, because I thought, you know, since you were there, I mm -hmm. mean, what people are talking about. I mean, um, I'm not surprised that uh, hardly anybody talks positively about the Palestinian National Authority, mm -hmm. except those people who are, you know, have uh, material gains mm -hmm. uh, from it, especially mm -hmm. the authority people, mm -hmm. you know, and the bureaucrats, mm -hmm. the top mm -hmm. bureaucrats, etc. But uh, the population, I mean, you know, we talked about uh, Ramallah as a bubble, mm -hmm. but actually a bubble that sometimes opens up, uh, you know, to the uh, outside world, which is occupation and so forth. Mm -hmm. So as a bubble, it, is, it tells you something about occupation. Mm -hmm. But once it is violated by Israeli troops and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, detriment of uh, the authority of the Palestinian National Authority, whatever the authority it has, mm -hmm. you know, it might have. Um, so it tells you, like, actually there is no safe place in, uh, in the West Bank at all. Uh, regardless of the Oslo Accords in, uh, of 1993 that tried to regulate certain kind of areas. This is for the national authority and this is for the Israelis. Absolutely. And yeah. this is uh, like in common, you know, in terms of security. I mean, I so, think that in addition to that, the thing that just struck me over and again was, especially because I was traveling back and forth between Ramallah and Abu Dis fairly regularly, and um, it's, it's dangerous to do that, especially mm -hmm. for young men. Mm -hmm. um, there's just this kind of sense, even if they're living in Ramallah and have nice houses and you know, parents who are well-to-do, just that, that journey alone is one where you never know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just coming over from India and in India, nobody wears seatbelts, <laughs> and the roads are kind of crazy. <laughs> and so when I was on the road, I noticed that everyone buckled up as soon as we got onto, you know, uh, the, out of out of town. And I oh. thought, oh, they, you know, they they wear seatbelts here. They care about their safety. <laughs> but then, <laughs> they, when we get that, when we enter into Abu Dis, the seatbelts all came out. And what I realized is that it's a pretext for the Israelis to pull people over if they're not wearing seat belts and take them away and mm -hmm. arrest them and trump up a bunch of charges against them. Mm -hmm. And almost every day on the road, I would just see things happening mm -hmm. or hear of things happening. And so that it's not only a, um, a horrible inconvenience to have it take so long and be so unpredictable how long it takes to get from one place to the other, but it's also just not safe, especially mm -hmm. I think for for young men. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that even in the most privileged of spaces, there is this kind of stress and oppressiveness. And I mean, I had this um, kind of small taste of this because my luggage got lost on my way over, which is not that big of a deal. <laughs> I mean, it's an <laughs> inconvenience to be sure. Yeah. But I realized when I was at the desk uh -huh. for the lost luggage that I could not give my address uh -huh. because you can't say you're going to the West Bank. Uh -huh. And so I, I was just like, and I don't know any Israeli Jews. And <laughs> so I just had no idea what address to give. And so I got into the cab with the, my pal the Palestinian cab driver. And he said, I'll take care of this for you. Mm -hmm. And he, he gave the name of, he called and gave the name of an, a hotel. And, um, and, and I thought, how am I gonna know? I, and I said, can I get your phone number? And he's like, oh no, I'll just call you and when I have your bag. And a few days passed and they found my bag. And I called this hotel that he was gonna have it delivered to. And they said, well, we can't accept a bag if you're not staying there. So then I, I didn't, and I didn't know what his name was or how to get hold of him. And I couldn't figure out where to say to deliver my bag. Mm -hmm. And it just was like this small thing about the kind of stress of being, you know, like somehow you're a criminal because you're staying in the West mm -hmm. Bank or, or you don't exist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I will say also my bag appeared about five days later and I, I didn't know what happened or 
how it happened. Uh, where did and it appear? It, it, it just I got a call from the university, and they said, your bag has been delivered to the university. Oh. Um, that same driver took me to the airport when I left, and he said, I'm glad you got your bag. <laughs> <laughs> same guy. Yeah. He got my bag for me. Yeah, wow. um, and so there are also these ways that people have to, or that are very resourceful. Mm -hmm. um, he had friends at that hotel. <laughs> ah, I see. And so he did arrange for that yeah. bag to yeah. go there. And that was the other thing that struck me over and again was even as there are these, um, these ways that life is very dangerous and oppressive, people um, have resourceful ways, little and big, mm -hmm. of, of getting around conditions of mm -hmm. occupation. And this was just a tiny example, yeah, yeah, but no, one, one that was yeah. kind of telling to me. Where was the hotel? Uh, uh, occupied East Jerusalem. Ah. It's a hotel that, uh, that is friend, quite friendly to Palestinians. Ah, I see. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, that tells you like how uh, what Palestinians have to go through on a yeah, daily basis. Yeah, it's such a yeah. you know like there was both there was such coordination needed for something that under uh, normal circumstances would have been the easiest thing ever. I would have given my address and my bag would have been delivered and that would have mm -hmm. been it. But instead, there was just this you know, on my part, endless amount of stress and attempts of workarounds and everything. And on the part of this driver, a kind of planned, coordinated way to do this that was pretty easy for him because he's used to these mm -hmm. kind of things. Yeah. So, like, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you have been active for the longest time in um, um, issues of justice, uh, especially around the question of Palestine. Um, and, um, you know, settler colonialism and all of that um, regarding Palestine, among other places. But um, <clears throat> I'm thinking, like, uh, now that you have come back, okay, uh, what would you be doing uh, to try and publicize? O of course, we are doing this program now, which mm -hmm. is obvious. But, uh, you know, uh, other things that... Uh, you um, are planning on uh, working uh, with uh, and so forth. Uh, um, I am also uh, reminded that um, actually Anne Wright, uh, who is uh, in town now, and in fact, um, at one point this semester, she spoke to my class early mm -hmm. on and so forth about the boat to Gaza and mm -hmm. all of that. So that there are people who are doing these kinds of things to try and lift the siege on Gaza, etc., or at least uh, <clears throat> call attention to the fact that Gaza is, uh, Gaza is actually really uh, occupied. Uh, and in fact, uh, the siege is uh, uh, taking its toll on its people and so forth. So what are some of the things that uh, you will be um, um, engaging in, in terms of activities, etc., to promote uh, that kind of knowledge about Palestine and occupation? Um, so one thing that I'm working on two different campaigns at the national level, and one is um, against study abroad programs. Um, and that's a, a US ACBI campaign mm -hmm. that we're coordinating. And the reason for that being is that um, Israeli study abroad programs are discriminatory, on their face discriminatory, mm. in that Palestinian Americans, and you were talking about the large number of diasporic Palestinians, mm. Mm -hmm. um, could not go. You as a faculty member, of course, could not, if you wanted to, mm -hmm. <laughs> go as the faculty advisor mm. um, if UH had a um, study abroad program in Israel. So one of the campaigns that we're working on is to to expose these study abroad programs in Israel as racist and discriminatory. Um, the other campaign that I've been working on has been um, part of the um, Against Canary Mission project. Canary Mission is an anonymous website that smears anyone that does any kind of work on behalf of Palestine. Um, for students, this can be quite serious because they profile the students, they tweet out to their prospective employers or grad uh, admissions committees that these students are supportive of terrorism or anti-Semitic. Um, I have a Canary Mission profile, and for me, there's a lot of other stuff if I'm Googled because you know I'm 50-some years old and I've been doing this a long time. But for these students, that might be the only thing that 
appears for them if an employer Googles them. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a site called Against Canary Mission that lets students profile themselves and say in their own words what they're doing that is not shameful or terroristic or anti-Semitic, but in fact brave and principled. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on that project. And then in the context of Hawaii, um, we have some visitors coming in the fall. One of them is Ramsey Baroud, who will be coming in early November. Um, Tariq Luthan is coming in September. Um, he's a, a po young poet and community organizer. And I think having Palestinians come to the university and also speak in the churches and in the community is a really good way to build awareness. Um, and also connections amongst Kamakan, um, Kanaka Maoli organizers and scholars and Palestinians who um, can um, talk together about situations of settler colonialism and occupation that are quite different but also have points of connection. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm kind of interested in doing what I can to foster those kinds of exchanges and dialogues. Yeah. Because uh, I remember we uh, had a program where we also talked about canary missions uh, mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. in connection with uh, BDS mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and just like um, doing uh, pro-Palestinian work in the United mm -hmm. States. I mean, and uh, how what kind of uh, Zionist attacks uh, you uh, get uh, uh, get perpetrated uh, against you mm -hmm. uh, just because of trying to tell another, um, you know, um, another aspect of, of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the Zionists want uh, their own uh, rendition or narrative uh, to be the only, uh, the, not mm -hmm. only the dominant one, but the only one. They mm -hmm. don't want any other opposition to it, etc. So it is very important that, uh, you know, you have uh, a lot of people in uh, the United States now talking about this. And uh, I know you are uh, uh, leading in uh, uh, that kind of effort uh, nationally, especially uh, in terms of the academic boycott um, of uh, the Israeli universities and so forth. Um, so could you uh, uh, say more about uh, some of the activities uh, that you will be following in terms of U.S. ACB? Um, I, I mean, aside from the question of the study abroad and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that, that we're working on with U.S. ACB is organizing a Palestine literature festival. Mm -hmm. And this is our first time trying to do something like this. Um, and the idea is to bring a number of Palestinian writers together to the U.S to share their work and um, you know, to do the kind of thing that's been done in Ramallah, mm -hmm. but to do that in the US. So that's mm -hmm. something that US ACB is working on. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our energies are also being used against a racist and nuisance lawsuit that, the, um, that has been waged against the American Studies Association for its academic boycott resolution. And that was um, in 2014 or 13. I'm not remembering yeah, I think which. 14. Yeah. I think 14. Yeah. But anyway, that lawsuit is, char is, is really actually being directed against U.S. ACBE members, especially women of color. And, um, and we are unfortunately having to spend time exposing that mm -hmm. as the bogus lawsuit mm -hmm. uh, that it is. Yeah. And there are um, uh, other... And lawfare uh, is something yeah. that Zionists are increasingly yeah. making use of. Yeah. And they do not win their cases, but they Just they are able to yeah. use a lot of resources yeah. up and take up a lot yeah. of people's time. Make trouble for you, um, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, the, the, you know, we still have like five minutes or so. So um, uh, the, uh, the, the other thing, like, uh, for instance, the uh, Association for Asian American Studies have also, like... Uh, uh, did something against uh, Israeli universities, etc., in terms of U.S. ACB and so forth, and then ASA, and then um, and MLA. Uh, MLA. Mm -hmm. uh, so where where is uh, uh, anything about the uh, American Anthropological Association? Or? Um, they also waged a really um, amazingly effective campaign, although they lost it by a very small margin. I think the amount of education that they did and um, the kind of consciousness raising they did 
in what I think was a really exemplary and inspiring campaign was 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 extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that academic associations have been an important site for education mm -hmm. and for mobilizing people, even, you know, even if the resolutions don't end up passing. Yeah. I still think they do an important kind of work. Right. So American Studies Association, uh, Association for Asian American Studies. Critical Ethnic Studies. Uh, critical Ethnic Native Studies. Native American uh, and yeah, Indigenous NISA, uh, NISA, Studies NISA, Association. Yeah. And uh, there's a humanities. MLA, yeah. Uh, MLA, uh, no, MLA. No, they haven't. Uh, yeah. MLA not only yeah. did not pass yeah. the boycott resolution, right. but actually passed one against, against well, yeah. boycott. Yeah. And that was a, a very sorry moment in yeah. MLA history yeah. that I yeah. hope we will see overturned. Yeah, yeah. So there'll be more, um, you know, uh, events happening and uh, more mm -hmm. attempts regarding those kinds of huge associations, even mm -hmm. the American Anthropological Association mm -hmm. as well, because these mm -hmm. are important. And these are things that are important, uh, you know, to show <coughs> that um, not everybody agrees in the United States with the state of Israel and its uh, discriminatory practices and its colonialism, settler colonialism, and so on. And um, it is uh, also heartening to see uh, a lot of younger uh, people uh, involved in those kinds of uh, issues. We have on campus uh, faculty and student uh, kind of association. For justice uh, in yeah. Palestine, yeah. So uh, could you say something about that? Perhaps they would be active this, uh, you know, not in the summer necessarily, but in the fall. Well, I think yeah. we will be organizing yeah. for the visits yeah. by um, Ramzi Baroud yeah. and um, Tariq Luthan, mm -hmm. among, other, among other events. And I do want to just say back to the associations mm -hmm. that um, one of the things that I think those struggles have in common with what you see happening in Palestine is the sense that even if small battles are lost or resolutions are not passed, there is a sense that this occupation will not last forever. Um, you, don't, you don't have an occupation that lasts forever and ever. And one of the things that I kept hearing from people in Palestine um, this last month was um, this wall will come down. This wall will not stand forever. Mm -hmm. And so even though I had said there was a kind of mix about hopefulness and mm -hmm. hopelessness, mm -hmm. uh, there was also this sense that things don't stand still mm -hmm. and that that wall will come down. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, I am Palestinian, right? So um, we, we are very um, <clears throat> optimistic uh, in terms of uh, not that there will be like... Uh, <clears throat> peace between uh, the state of Israel, which is Zionist, uh, colonialist uh, entity, and uh, you know, the Palestinian people. But uh, it is a matter of that, again, occupation is not going to last. Uh, the law of return uh, will be implemented, and the fight for justice continues um, you know, um, among the Palestinians, etc., but also among all peace-loving uh, people uh, all over. You know, including, of course, in the United States, and these activities are some of the things that uh, mm -hmm. you know actually we are doing. So it's uh, interesting to note uh, those kinds of issues. And uh, another thing, in June there will be like a, a film, film festival, festival. Yes. Um, at the Doris Duke mm -hmm. Theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forget the dates, but uh, you know, it's so, early yeah, June, early and that June. is an opportunity to yeah. see some Palestinian yeah. film. Yeah. So yeah. that would be something that mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, also uh, work on. And uh, finally, any final words? Uh? Um, I think that the, the, the final words I would have would just be the kind of excesses of violence that we're seeing in Gaza right now, along with the kind of repressions of free speech and mobilizing for Palestine that we're seeing in the U.S. as a, as a much gentler and less violent accompany of of that are actually signs that that the boycott divestment and struggles movement is gaining ground that Palestinians are being heard and that this violence will not continue okay thank you very much thank we you. are flat out of time uh, thank you very much Mahalo uh, and see you in September thank Aloha. You.